This is an AZ Court Help Legal Talk on Foreclosing on a Tax Lien by Michael Fleischman of Fleischman Law. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity and I hope that I can uh, uh, provide you all with uh, good information. Basically, just going to give kind of a, a brief overview of the uh, tax lien process. Uh, but uh, real quickly, just by way of background, uh, my name is Michael Fleischman, as already indicated. Uh, I've been practicing coming up on, I don't know, 17 and a half years, which is hard to believe, uh, and have been involved in tax liens really from the beginning, uh, kind of stumbled into it as I was working at the, the first law firm. Uh, we had a client that was purchasing uh, properties down in uh, Cochise County. Uh, they came across uh, the opportunity to purchase uh, tax liens, and so... Uh, kind of worked through that process and have uh, been doing it ever since. And I think the most appropriate starting point for me, instead of really explaining how it is that we ever even get to a tax lien, is really just to start from the, the idea that uh, tax liens uh, are sold. Uh, they're sold by public auction each February. Every uh, county, uh, all 15 counties in Arizona, are required by statute to uh, publicize and provide um, a list for sale at uh, public auction. Uh, each county has a certain amount of, of flexibility to both um, interpret the statutes and uh, they do so differently. Uh, some counties will have uh, live auctions and uh, many uh, have moved to an online system, which uh, really uh, is uh, a very different way of going about it. And, and the reason I say that, for example, in Pima County, up until COVID, uh, we had live auctions. Uh, the dynamics of a live auction, as you might imagine, uh, are, are very different. Uh, you Being physically present uh, can, can just change those dynamics. And it really limits the number of people who are able to bid on tax liens. Uh, since Pima County went uh, with a lot, uh, excuse me, an online auction, uh, you have bidders from anywhere, uh, you know, Florida, New Jersey, and potentially uh, anywhere in the world. And so that, that's really changed the dynamics. Uh, it also brings in um, a larger pool of uh, investors, uh, many larger investors in the process. And so the basic idea you know, behind a tax lien is that a owner of property um, has to pay real estate taxes. Those are assessed by uh, the county assessor and the treasurer is the one responsible for sending out tax bills and doing uh, the collection on that. If somebody falls behind uh, on their taxes, uh, the treasurer will send out uh, delinquent notices and eventually, uh, it typically takes uh, kind of a lag time of about 18 months of uh, delinquent taxes before uh, the county treasurer will uh, make available uh, a tax lien against uh, a particular property at the public auction. And so uh, by the time, again, the public auction rolls around, which happens uh, in every county at some point in February. Uh, the statutes mandate that uh, the, the public auction takes place in, in February each year. Tax liens will be uh, auctioned off. The statutory uh, and, and really the way that this works is a tax lien is offered for sale. And what the buyer of the tax lien is, is offering is to pay essentially the owner's taxes for them. And in return, they get an interest rate uh, on uh, that investment. Uh, the statutory rate starts at 16% and is bid down. So what's happening at that public auction is uh, the investor is purchasing the right to buy that lien uh, for whatever percentage rate uh, that they're willing to accept. And so while it starts at 16%, it could go all the way down to 0%. Uh, average uh, interest rates over the past several years um, in the major counties has literally been two to three percent. You have a lot of institutional um, uh, investors, hedge funds who have come in who are interested in buying liens and large amounts of them on the hope that uh, they uh, might be able to foreclose on properties. And th this has been a 
sizable sea change in the way that tax liens have been traditionally uh, offered and purchased. Uh, you used to have a much larger pool of small investors really just looking for an interest rate. They were not so interested in foreclosing on properties, but simply uh, being afforded the opportunity uh, to make a decent interest rate. Because the way to look at it again is uh, the, the tax lien investor is really just stepping in and, and in effect offering a loan to the property owner who is delinquent on their taxes. If a tax lien is not sold at the public auction, uh, it is deemed uh, stricken uh, back to uh, essentially the county and what, or to the state is, is how it's uh, really viewed. Um, before it even makes it to the public auction, the county is receiving uh, a 16% return. And so if somebody comes along uh, after a year and a half of having delinquent taxes and pays it off, they will have paid uh, essentially the county for floating that delinquent taxes for that year and a half at 16%. So if a tax lien investor buys a lien at the auction for say 3%, in some ways, that's a fairly inexpensive loan to uh, the property owner. And then when they are in a position to pay that off, uh, they're going to pay off the principal amount of the taxes uh, plus the uh, interest rate that was due to the um, to the investor, and so that's how you get to, uh, to uh, the the point of somebody owning a tax lien. The way that the statutes are set up is that if a tax lien investor holds on to uh, the tax lien for a sufficient amount of time, they can begin a tax lien foreclosure. Uh, against that uh, parcel. Uh, effectively, it takes three years from the point that the tax lien investor has purchased the lien. And so by the time an investor is actually beginning the tax lien foreclosure process, there are five years of delinquent taxes. And so uh, there, there are a number of safeguards in place in terms of noticing provisions, and a lot of time has passed before anyone's even in a position to actually uh, foreclose on that lien. And so the way the process works is uh, if somebody is uh, in a position to uh, start that process, the tax lien has uh, uh, ripened uh, the, the sufficient amount of time, again, uh, three years from the point of purchase, or uh, there is one other way that somebody could uh, begin an action almost immediately is uh, I mentioned that if a tax lien is not purchased at the public auction, it's uh, struck to the state and an investor uh, could uh, go into the county uh, treasurer's office and purchase that lien, uh, what we call over the counter. Uh, it automatically uh, will uh, accrue interest at the, the statutory maximum of 16%. And if it's been uh, hanging out there long enough, uh, someone could actually start that foreclosure action immediately again, but it always is gonna take three years from uh, the date of, uh, that it was first offered for sale. So the process moving forward for an investor uh, that may come to me and say, you know, we, we have a couple of these tax liens that we would like to begin the foreclosure process on. Uh, my process is to, uh, and this is uh, driven by the statutes. Uh, this is all in title 42 of the Arizona revised statutes. Uh, section 18 covers uh, most of the process. The, the notice statutes are uh, title 42, uh, section 18201 uh, and beyond. And the process is to send a pre-foreclosure notice letter to the owner of record according to the records of the treasurer, the assessor, and potentially even the recorder. Uh, the statutes provide a couple of different ways uh, by which uh, the uh, that me operating as the attorney uh, have to uh, send out that notice. Uh, what we do is we send out letters. Uh, the letter indicates uh, the parcel number. It indicates the, the certificate of purchase number uh, that the investor has, uh, the proposed date of uh, filing of a tax lien foreclosure action, uh, and, and indicates how the lien can be paid off by contacting the treasurer directly. Uh, we send those letters by uh, certified mail return uh, receipt requested. Uh, what's interesting about that, uh, this has created recently um, uh, some, some pretty involved litigation as to 
whether uh, and how uh, notice is given. Uh, the, the statute, again, only requires that, the, that I send a notice letter just to the owner of record and to the two choices. I can send the notice letter to the owner of record according to the most recent, let's say, deed that has been recorded uh, in the, uh, the given county's recorder's office. Um, now, that's one way you can do it. The other is to send the certified letters to uh, the owner of record according to the records of the treasurer and the assessor, often gonna be the exact same address. And so you send those certified letters. Well, if the letter comes back undeliverable, and I can tell you from experience that that is a very common occurrence, is that the letters come back undeliverable uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, someone may um, just choose not to pick up the certified letter, and that's going to come back unclaimed. Recently, there, as I noted, there's been some litigation where owners of the property have, have claimed that we were never provided adequate notice. And obviously there is a, a long history of uh, even US Supreme Court cases that deal with uh, what is uh, the, the appropriate level of, of notice. Um, essentially it's a, you know, a procedural due process right uh, to notice before a foreclosure action can actually take place. And the problem, of course, is you know we send out these certified letters. Uh, if they come back as undeliverable, either because they're unclaimed or the address is bad, how do we then go about providing adequate notice? And def uh, some recent defendants have challenged the idea that notice is uh, basically they're they're claiming that notice is inadequate by simply sending it to uh, the owner of record uh, and, and letters come back undeliverable. Uh, the courts. Uh, both at the trial court level and recently the Arizona Court of Appeals have essentially expanded the um, requirements under the law as to what is adequate notice. And what the courts have recently ruled is that if I send out a certified letter to an owner of record and I receive it back uh, unclaimed, uh, that should be an indication to me that um, more uh, due diligence may be required. The same, of course, would be true if I get it back and it says uh, undeliverable, uh, you know, return to sender, address not known. Now, an owner of record obviously has an obligation to update the records, but the courts have recently said that the attorneys, uh, the owner of the tax lien, uh, have a heightened duty to do additional due diligence. And that has created its own set of challenges for practitioners in this area to figure out, well, what do we do? Um, for instance, during COVID, uh, we might get a return uh, receipt uh, for a certified uh, letter that simply says COVID-19. And that may mean that the letter carrier dropped the letter uh, at a home, but I have no idea whether somebody actually received it, whether it's been signed. And so I'm left wondering, what do I do? In response, many of uh, the tax lien practitioners have moved to sending both certified mail and uh, regular mail. Um, in some ways, regular mail is a far more appropriate and practical way to provide notice uh, to owners uh, than sending certified mail, which again, somebody can simply ignore. You typically can't ignore the mail that lands in your mailbox. And so We've been sending out uh, letters now by certified mail, return receipt requested, regular mail, and I've gone even a further step of doing uh, address checks. I use um, a, a, a private investigator to uh, basically run um, proprietary database research uh, to, to do that. And so what the courts are effectively saying is uh, they're putting a, a greater burden on the tax lien uh, investor at the front end uh, which involves, you know, some cost. Uh, the statutes are very clear that uh, investors are essentially to be recouped for the work that they're doing. Uh, the the, the trade-off is this. Uh, investor, you know, the owner of record is delinquent on their taxes, and somebody steps up and pays those taxes on their behalf. In return, they get an interest rate, and the statutes uh, and the system has long been designed 
uh, to effectively protect the, uh, the interests of the, the tax lien investor. And the reason for that, uh, uh, and, and this system has gone back to the 20s, um, and it, it's, it's a very effective system, right? Investors are willing to step up to get a halfway decent or acceptable interest rate, whatever they choose is acceptable in their mind, um, knowing that the counties will get the necessary funds back into the system so that they can pay police officers and firefighters and build roads. Uh, absent that system, there would be no incentive for anybody to actually pay their uh, taxes if there was no consequence for not paying them. And so the system's actually worked pretty well, but this, this new change has put some of the burden on the tax lien investor and increased the cost of doing so. Um, and that may change some of the dynamics over time. So let me move on to what happens um, after you send out the notice letters. Uh, the notice letters give the owner of record uh, essentially 30 days in which to pay the tax lien at no consequence uh, to the, the tax lien holder. There's no attorney's fees or costs that they have to pay. If they, if they go in during that time period after receiving the letter, pay the taxes, uh, that's the end of the deal. And the tax lien investor gets uh, their principal uh, payment back plus whatever accrued interest. Uh, at the interest rate that they, you know, bought that lien at. If, if they held up the paddle or they put into the computer, I'm willing to accept 3%. They're going to get 3% um, uh, simple interest uh, accruing. Uh, the way that the interest works for um, what that's worth uh, is uh, each month that passes that you hold that lien uh, is an automatic uh, months, um, you know, it, it's one month's interest that uh, accrues. So the second, let's say March 1st comes along, uh, and the, the delinquent tax has not been paid, that interest rate will accrue for that month. So the next step is, is a judicial tax lien foreclosure matter. So by judicial, I mean that the, it's going to be uh, an action that is filed in uh, superior court. Uh, we start the process by filing a complaint and uh, that complaint uh, lays out the allegations of uh, you know, what appropriate due diligence was uh, done in advance and in compliance with the statutes. Uh, and notice and um, lays out you know, the statutory basis for uh, the tax lien foreclosure action. The, the, the end result, as you can probably <laughs> understand, right, is that the, if the tax lien is not redeemed by the end of the tax lien foreclosure, the treasurer will actually issue a treasurer's deed, uh, deeding the property to the tax lien holder. And uh, it doesn't happen all that often, but it happens enough that there uh, are, are sufficient numbers of deeds that the, each county treasurer is uh, issuing each year, and, and there are a number of these uh, cases. Uh, so once once the complaint has actually been filed, uh, we're uh, entitled or we're obligated to obviously serve that on the owner of record and any interested party uh, by by way of uh, any recorded document. So in advance of filing the tax lien foreclosure action, I will obtain uh, a litigation guarantee from a title company, uh, which will uh, list for me uh, any person or entity that has a recorded interest in that property. And it can be any number of things. It could be an Arizona Department of Revenue lien. It could be a, a first position mortgage. It could be a judgment. Uh, it could be a criminal restitution lien. It could be an access lien. Uh, there are any number of different um, uh, recorded interest against those properties. And so again, in conjunction with uh, naming and serving the owner of the property, I also have to name and serve any of those interested entities. And you kind of take it through the civil litigation process from there. Um, many of these cases are um, sort of uncontested because the only real issue is are you going to pay the taxes or uh, have you uh, basically walked away from the property? Uh, there, there's, there's not a whole lot of litigation that, that does take place uh, occasionally. Um, somebody may uh, contest, uh, let's say the noticing issue uh, that I just uh, went through. Um, but by and large, um, either the owner of the property decides to step up and pay the taxes or they let the property go or an interested party uh, has the opportunity to step up and pay the, uh, the taxes. And even um, in, in rare circumstances, you may have a competing tax lien holder who may step in and pay those taxes. 
uh, in several counties, again, uh, based on each county's read of the statutes, they may allow for uh, there to be a competing lien holder. And the way that this works is, uh, let's say I have a client that purchased uh, the 2016 tax uh, lien. Uh, the owner of the property uh, hasn't paid uh, the, the 2016 taxes, but let's say they didn't pay the 2017 uh, taxes as well. My client has an opportunity to uh, what is known as subtax the lien, basically adding the delinquent 2017 taxes to my client's 2017 tax lien uh, in the process, uh, you know, sort of adding to the investment. But if I, if my client chose not to uh, subtax that lien, another tax lien holder uh, at the auction coming around the next year could actually purchase that lien themselves. And then you could have a competing lien scenario. There are times where you could have two competing lien holders bring uh, foreclosure actions at the exact same time. And, and uh, that creates kind of a mess, um, but it, it's almost a race to the courthouse at that point. But at any point during that process, one lien holder can actually redeem uh, or pay off the other uh, lien holder's tax lien, and they're out of the picture, as it were. Um, that is kind of the basic process of, of, of naming and serving the appropriate parties. If they have not uh, stepped up to pay the taxes, uh, we move on to you know, filing a default uh, a application with the court and eventually moving to a, a final judgment hearing where you ask the court for uh, entry of final judgment for closing the rights of all the parties to redeem the tax lien. If you reach that point, uh, it's effectively a ministerial act uh, by the treasurer um, to uh, issue the deed after receiving a certified copy of uh, the final judgment uh, and a $50 fee and uh, the deed is issued. And uh, that is my pleasure. Thank you, sir. All right, we'll close it now.